Please take your Bibles and turn with me back to that portion of text that we read just a few moments ago. Rather exciting narrative as we begin our study of the plagues that God sent to judge the land of Egypt. We have some very important things to learn, not merely from what those plagues are, and indeed they do judge the various gods of Egypt, but as we look at the order of the plagues, which is what we want to look at today, why in the world did God choose the plague of blood to be the first plague? He gave them water, or gave them blood to drink in place of their water, and that's why the message is entitled, and this is part two, it sure doesn't taste like cranberry juice, <laughs> and it certainly didn't. Rather powerful passage as we look at it today. Last week was the first half of the message, message that we looked at the fruit inspectors, that is, as Moses and Aaron stood before Pharaoh, they could see some fruit in his life. Now, Moses couldn't see Pharaoh's heart. Only God could see the heart, but Moses could see the external response. It was obvious that Pharaoh had hardened his heart, but God confirmed to Moses in our text what Moses could already see. God confirmed it with his word. The Bible tells us that we're supposed to be fruit inspectors. We don't like that when people are inspecting our fruit, but sinning Christians always hate the idea of fruit inspectors. And I gave you illustrations from college from last week, uh, how uh, people would say to me, who made you uh, a fruit inspector of my life? And of course, the Lord Jesus Christ is the one who did that. Uh, Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 and 2, doesn't just start stop with verse 1, which says, Judge not lest ye be judged, but he goes on, For with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged, and with what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you again. <clears throat> the idea is don't, don't be a hypocrite. It's not don't be a judge, it's don't be a hypocritical judge, because you're going to have the same standard laid down on your life as well. We saw Paul giving an illustration of that in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1, where he says that, concerning a man who was committing incest. He said, I have judged already. And then he tells them that they're supposed to be judging too. In fact, they're to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. And Paul goes on and he says, and there's some practical implications to that as well. There's some practical implications in terms of fellowship. You have to make the judgments because I've written unto you not to keep company of any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such a one not to eat. In other words, you have to be able to make a judgment in order to be able to act upon that judgment to determine with whom you will not have fellowship. In verses 12 and 13, he says, For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do ye not judge them that are within? So it's clearly in the context of a local church, a local church that is functioning as it sort of supposed to be functioning, but not really quite so. And he says, part of the reason that you're not functioning the way that you're supposed to be functioning is you refuse to judge those who are sinning. Yes, we are to be fruit inspectors. What is the fruit that's showing up in the life of the individuals around us? We noted that there are 184 mentions of fruit in the Bible, and it is something that is supposed to be visible in the life of the believer. Everyone bears some kind of a fruit. The question is, what kind of fruit are you bearing? Psalm 1 is a beautiful illustration. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Here's a man who's making some choices. Here's a man who's living a separated life. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and he's got a focus. He's not merely living apart in a box somewhere. He has a focus. His delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. It's the central focus of his life. Day and night. This morning, for some reason, I woke up at about 2.30 in the morning. You know what was running through my head? A hymn and some promises of scripture. I thought, wow, I didn't even know that was going on up there. <laughs> That was what was going through my mind. Dear people, is Christ the center of your life? Is he the one that you think about day and night? Is your heart filled with melody to the Lord? 
Is your heart filled with the Word of God so that whenever something happens in life, the first thing that happens is Scripture comes to mind? His delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And here is what the promise is. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. What's in the heart will be manifested in the life. What was in Pharaoh's heart was manifested in his life. There is a difference between the fruit that the life that is focused on Christ brings forth and the life that is focused on the world and carnal things and stuff and junk and the trivia of life and lusts and all the other horrible stuff that's out there. Different kind of fruit that that brings forth. We saw different kinds of fruit. Jesus talked about them. You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth corrupt fruit. And an evil tree cannot bring forth good fruit. Every tree that doth not bring forth good fruit is hewn down, cast into the fire. And then Jesus tells us, here is your commission as a fruit inspector. Wherefore, by their fruits, ye shall know them. Christ talks about that in four different chapters in the book of Matthew with the same illustration. Mark, he talks about it in three different chapters. Luke, he talks about it in three different chapters. No, four different chapters in Luke. In the Gospel of John, we find it in two different chapters. Do you think Jesus is making a point? He's making a point. If you say you're a Christian, there should be some fruit in your life. You know my old question, oh, you say you're a Christian. How has it changed your life? The Holy Spirit, by the grace of God, works in your heart. Jesus takes you as you are, but he does not leave you as you are. He changes you. He transforms you. He takes your mind and, and turns it in a different direction. Repentance means to turn about 180 degrees. When you trusted Christ, when you repented of your sins, God stopped you from going south and made you move north. Stopped you from going east and made you move west. That's what metanoia means. It's an about face, 180 degrees. A complete change of life and heart and mind. He takes you as you are, but he doesn't leave you as you are. If you're truly saved, if you have truly placed your faith in Jesus Christ, there is a change in your life. Have you been changed? We talked about the four different stages of fruit bearing last week. The stages that are listed for us in John chapter 15. Jesus says that you're going to bear fruit. Then he says that you're going to bear more fruit. Then he says that you're going to bear much fruit. Verse 8 of chapter 15, Here in my Father glorified that you bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciples. And then the fourth stage, you bear abiding fruit. Bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. That's whatsoever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it you. Bearing fruit, bearing more fruit, bearing much fruit, bearing abiding fruit. We didn't talk about it last week, but let me just add this here. Every Christian is going to bear some fruit. Some bear more than others, but all bear fruit. Jesus makes that clear in his parable of the sower. He talks about the sower went forth to sow. He sowed some seeds by the, that fell by the wayside. Fowl came, devoured them up. Some fell upon stony places where they had not much earth. Forthwith they sprung up because they had no deepness of earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched because they had no root and withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them, and other fell on good ground. Now listen. But other fell on good ground and brought forth fruit. Some in hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. It all brought forth fruit. Different amounts. Some a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. Some more than three times as much as the ones who bear the least. But the least bears some fruit. I need to ask myself that question every day. Am I bearing fruit? You know what the fruit of the Spirit is? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. But there's also the fruit that shows up in the works of our lives. 
not merely the character of Christ that manifests itself through us, but the works that we do bring glory to the Father. They don't save us, they don't sanctify us, but they show what is in our heart. They show who is in control of our life. They show what is the focus of our life. You say you're a Christian. So how has it changed your life? The flesh only brings forth fruit unto death. Paul says so in Romans 7, 5, For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin which were by the law did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. What kind of fruit is showing up in your life? We see the fruit of Pharaoh's life. We see what was in Pharaoh's heart. We see when God hardened Pharaoh's heart and Pharaoh hardened Pharaoh's heart. Half the, the times it talks about Pharaoh's hardened heart, it's talking about God hardening his heart. Half the times it talks about Pharaoh's hardened heart, it talks about Pharaoh hardening his heart. He is accountable. God is sovereign. We can't always put that together. But God is sovereign. And we are accountable for what we do. Now that brings us to our text for today. Plague of blood. Why was blood the first plague? Well, the first thing that I think as many... Bible commentators have already pointed out, is every plague that is listed in these ten plagues that hit Egypt is a judgment against a specific God of Egypt. The Nile was one of the principal gods of Egypt because it was worshipped, and listen carefully, it was worshipped as the source of life. The Nile was worshipped as the source of life. That was why it was considered a god. There could be no life in Egypt without the Nile. So I think the first reason that God turned the water to blood as the very first miracle or very first plague was because God was pointing back to himself as the creator. God is ultimately the only source of life. It was God who created life, not some inanimate source or created thing. You know what's happening here with this as the very first one of the plagues and why it is the first one of the plagues, not someplace down the list, somewhere. I think there's application today because life did not spontaneously arrive in some primordial soup composed of chemicals of hydrogen and oxygen as posited by the evolutionists. This was the very first plague because it was designed to establish God as the creator of life. God always goes back to his glory as creator first before moving on. The heavens declare the glory of God and the firma showeth his handiwork. God goes back to creation. We saw that when we were studying Acts 17 last week in the evening worship service. Paul on Mars Hill. He goes back to creation to the things that the pagans themselves would have understood. Things that they had squelched in their consciences. God is the creator. The second reason is very closely related to the first reason. God specifically has stated in scripture the location in which he has put life, and that is in the blood. But unless God puts life into the blood and also sustains life in the blood, there is no life. Blood by itself does not have life. Life does not exist because there is blood. That is why God, under the law, prohibited Israel from eating blood like the pagans did. And that prohibition also, as we see in Scripture, was a reminder to Israel of the first plague by which he had redeemed them, the plague of blood. Leviticus 17, beginning in verse 10. And whatsoever man there be of the house of Israel or of the strangers that sojourn among you that eateth any manner of blood... Now listen to this. This is a very, very serious curse that God places on them just for eating blood. I will even set my face against that soul that eateth blood and will cut him off from among his people. He was telling the Jews, you're no longer in Egypt. You don't do the same things that the Egyptians around you used to do. The first plague was the plague of blood. I want them to know, and Pharaoh especially, that I am the source of life. It's not the river Nile. It's not the god of the Nile. 
I am the living God. I am the source of life. I am the one who puts the life into the blood. The blood without the life is rotten and corrupt and it stinks. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. Verse 11. The life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. Therefore I said unto the children of Israel, No so shall of you shall eat blood, neither shall any stranger that sojourneth among you eat blood. And whatsoever man there be of the children of Israel or of the strangers that sojourn among you, which hunteth and catcheth any beast or fowl that may be eaten, he shall even pour out the blood thereof and cover it with dust. Ah, where was man taken from? From the dust of the earth. And God made him and breathed into him the breath of life, and God breathed that life into the blood. The man became a living soul. Nephish. Same word that's used back there in verse 11. And whatsoever man there be, when you kill the animal, you pour out the blood, and you cover it with dust. Verse 14, for it is the life of all flesh. The blood of it is for the life thereof. Therefore, in other words, this is the reason why they should not eat the blood. I said unto the children of Israel, you shall, eat the, you shall eat the blood of no manner of flesh, for the life of all flesh is in the blood thereof. Whosoever eateth it shall be cut off. When was the law given? It was given immediately after the children of Israel left Egypt. They crossed the Red Sea. God gave them the law at Sinai. God made it very clear here. This is a rather serious crime. Did you get that? It's a capital crime. It's punishable by death. Think about that for a minute. That means it's as serious as murder or as adultery. Aren't you glad you're not back under the law again? Probably all of you have had you know, blood sausage at some time. Because it's a reminder of the first plague and of the source of life. God himself. It's also a picture of something else that angers God. We see that in our text here today. It's a picture of something else that angers God. It's a picture of a hardened heart. Did you know, I hope you did, that blood is closely connected to the heart in the Bible, as well as in our physiology classes. Blood is closely connected to the heart. We've just been told that God hardened Pharaoh's heart and Pharaoh hardened his own heart. We're dealing with a heart problem here. And that's the reason why blood is the first plague. We're dealing with a heart problem. By making the first plague a plague of rotting blood, we have a declaration by God that the hardness of Pharaoh's heart means that the blood has stopped flowing and as a result has begun to decay and it shows that death has set in. By the way, that's a very interesting question that we have perhaps for another time. But, you know, what about all this modern science that tries to figure out when is a person dead so they can harvest his organs? I've told you that when Judy died, while she was still warm there in the hospital, even before she'd taken her last breath, they were coming to me and trying to get me to sign papers to donate her organs, to scavenge the organs, because they know that the moment that the blood starts to decay, the organs are no good. Something wrong with that, folks. Is death the cessation of brain waves? No, because brain waves can come back. <clears throat> it's appointed unto man once to die. And after that, the judgment. Is the stopping of the heart death? No, because heartbeats can come back. That's the whole purpose of cardiopulmonary resuscitation. It's a point of that man wants to die. It's when the blood begins to corrupt. Because the life of the flesh is in the blood. And that's why they don't want the blood to start rotting. They want to get the blood pumped out of the system and get those organs as fast as they can, put them on ice, fly them where they're going to sell them for millions of dollars. Well, the heart and blood. Proverbs 14.30 A sound heart is the life of the flesh, but envy the rottenness of the bones. The life of the flesh is in the blood, and a sound heart is the life of the flesh. Just like the living fish died in the river and began to stink, so the living cells in the body die when the blood is no longer circulating and they begin to rot and they begin to stink too. The third reason where I think blood was the very first of the plagues that were given, is also stated in Leviticus 17. There must be blood for atonement. Verse 11 
uh, second phrase. We saw the first phrase, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. And now the next phrase, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. Blood, the vessel of life, is required to make an atonement for sin. All of the rotting blood of the Nile could never atone for sin. Dead blood or infected blood that's infected with death can never make an atonement for the soul. Only the pure living blood could do that. Pharaoh worshipped the Nile as the source of life. Pharaoh's source of life was dead. It was a false hope. It was a stinking, rotting, undrinkable river filled with death. It brought death to the fish that were in it, and it could not be drunk to give life. Only the blood of Christ is the pure river that can give life and make an atonement for our souls and cleanse our consciences. Hebrews chapter 9. Here we have the picture of the Old Testament tabernacle, but we have the one who is the high priest in the tabernacle of heaven. Christ being come a high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Redemption, folks, goes back to blood. All the blood in the Nile could never redeem Egypt. They were needed to understand that. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth the purifying of the flesh. How much more? Verse 14, I love this verse. One of my favorite verses in Hebrews. It goes so far. Not merely that our sins have been forgiven, but we still sit and moan and groan about all the things. Listen to verse 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot, there is no stain, there is no sin, there is no rotting, there is no imperfection. It's pure, it's holy, it's living blood. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, not merely forgive your sins, but listen to what it says. Purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. The blood of Christ not only provides redemption, it not only provides forgiveness, the blood of Christ cleanses our conscience. That thing that nags on us in the back of our minds, we're always fretting and fuming and fussing about. The blood of Christ cleanses our conscience. Because your conscience, as it, as it jiggles around in the back of your head and agitates and as it bounces back and forth, it keeps you from doing anything. It keeps you from serving to you. Think, oh man, if somebody knew this about my past, uh, the, the, oh man, I, I better not witness because otherwise somebody will bring up my past. You know, purge your conscience from dead works. What were those things you did in the past? They're called dead works. And why is it necessary to purge your conscience? So that you can serve the living God. The blood of Christ cleanses your conscience. The blood of Christ makes it possible for you to take the step forward and enter the Christian life with victory. Purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And for this cause he is the mediator of a New Testament, that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Not merely of eternal life, but inheritance. There are going to be tears in heaven, folks. Some folks that can get up there, they'll have done nothing to serve the Savior. Their works will be put out there in front of the blowtorch, and they'll burn up wood, hay, and stubble. There will be no gold or silver or precious stones. They'll not receive a reward. They're saved, Paul says, yet so as by fire, but nothing to lay at the Savior's feet. Is that how you want it to be? Is that how you want it to turn out when you, you will stand before Christ? Is that how you want it to turn out? Will you be ashamed at his coming? 
Every man that hath this hope, that is the blessed hope, the hope that Christ is coming at any moment, every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Being a Christian changes your life. He purifieth himself, even as he is pure. I know you think I hit that subject too often, but folks, we live in a culture where anything goes and where nothing seems to matter and where most of the church, the body of Christ, is sound asleep and they don't seem to care and so why should we care? And so we begin to get lulled into sleep of complacency and we no longer begin to care and our lives no longer make an impact for Christ and the devil sings his lullaby as he smiles and we go to sleep with all the rest. The blood of Christ. He goes on, he talks about the blood being sprinkled to cleanse all the different objects within the tabernacle. And verse 22, And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without the shedding of blood there is no remission. You see, blood is very important to God. Without the shedding of blood there's no remission. But when the Nile turned to blood, was that blood that was shed? No. That was water turned to blood death had to come to a living creature who shed its blood first in typological significance in the Old Testament where the picture was portrayed of the coming Messiah the one who on Calvary's cross would shed his blood living blood to make an atonement for the soul for it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul you begin to understand why blood was the first of the plagues that was sent Further, from this passage that we've just read, and I've only skipped over it, it's a beautiful passage, verses 11 through 28, deal with all of that and how Christ is offered to bear our sins. But the blood sacrifice had to be offered by a qualified priest. Not a pagan priest or a magician. Remember verse 11, it said, But Christ being come and high priest of good things to come. Jesus is our great high priest. He is the one who offered his perfect, spotless, sinless blood. It had to be offered by a qualified priest, not a pagan priest or a magician as in Egypt. The magicians turned water to blood, by the way, very unhelpful. If they were trying to impress Pharaoh, Pharaoh needed water to drink, not more blood. Further, notice that it also says that all the water stored in the vessels throughout all the land of Egypt in vessels of stone and vessels of wood all of that stored up water was also turned to blood by the way that proves that this was not some kind of a natural occurrence of red mudslides into the river upstream some unbelievers have posited oh that's what happened some red mud you know slid down and there was a huge mudslide and so the whole water of the the river turned to this dark red color but it really didn't turn to blood uh, and it was it was just you know something that happened upstream no because all the water that was in the vessels turned to blood. It wasn't some kind of red algae that hit the river right at that time because all the water that was in the vessels turned to blood. It affected not only the main Nile River but all of its tributaries. Now listen, the Nile River is a long river. It begins up just outside of Lake Tanganyika and it is 4,157 miles long. You know how long that is? The United States is only about 3,000 miles wide. That's a river that runs all the way across the United States and 1,157 miles out into the ocean. That's a long river, folks. It's just all the, blood, all the water of the Nile turned to blood. It took a whole week for it to drain out. 4,157 miles long. That's wider than the United States by 35%. That's a lot of blood. The Nile River is also interesting in that it runs south to north, unlike most rivers of the world. This was not a natural event. It was a supernatural event. Forget all those hypocritical pagan naysayers who tell you that something else happened that was just a natural cause. The plague affected the water and all the vessels of Egypt, just like the stored up good works that people are relying on can never give them life. They were forced to dig in the earth to try to find water. It seems rather serious to go a week without water in a hot country like Egypt. Fourth, the plague of blood is a portent of future judgments on the world. In fact, we see some things happening in the book of Revelation that bring us back to two witnesses 
whom I believe were Moses and Elijah because it says they have the power to bring all the different plagues on so often as they will. Listen to what the book of Revelation says. You know, in the book of Revelation, blood is mentioned 17 times. Sometimes in the book of Revelation, it's related to the blood of Christ. Sometimes it's related to the blood of martyrs. But seven times, like the seven days of the plague of the blood of Moses, seven times it's related to a specific judgment. Notice also, the judgments in the book of Revelation are divided into seven seals, seven trumpets, and seven bowls, or vials, V-I-A-L-S. God gives the earth increasing judgments of blood as we move from the seals to the trumpets and to the bowls. The seals, by the way, just for a quick overview of Revelation, haven't preached it here, but the seals take place during the first three and a half years. <clears throat> the trumpets take place during the second three and a half years up to the last week. The bowls take place during the last week of judgment. Revelation 6.12 And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. Revelation 8, 7. The first angel sounded. So that's a trumpet. So we move from the seals to the trumpets here. And there followed hail and fire mingled with blood. And they were cast upon the earth. And a third part of the trees was burnt up and all green grass was burnt up. Hail and fire. We're going to talk about that later when we get a little farther down to the judgments, uh, the plagues that are given uh, that God sends during the days of Moses. Verse 8. And the second angel sounded trumpet judgment again. And as it were... A great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea, and a third part of the sea became blood. That's even more blood than was in the Nile River. Then there are the two witnesses in chapter 11. These have power to shut heaven. This is verse 6, chapter 11. That it rained not on the earth in the days of their prophecy, and they have power over the waters to turn them to blood, and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. Interesting. The one plague that is mentioned that the two witnesses can perform in the book of Revelation, the one that's mentioned by name, is power over the waters to turn them to blood. And the rest are just sort of lumped together in that phrase, and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. You see, God is giving a picture of what's coming when he judges the earth, the world. It's too long of a detailed discussion to go into here, but but Egypt is a type or a picture of the world in Scripture. Many, many places in the Old Testament give us that Im implication. Pharaoh is a picture of Satan, the god of this world. God says, let me just tell you what's really going to come. I'm going to do it to a real man in a real location, but for some real purposes. And one of those is to forewarn you that there is a judgment coming on this kingdom of darkness, planet Earth. And the God of this world, who's the devil. And judgment is coming. And I'm going to send some witnesses. And you know, I think it's Moses and Elijah who are the two witnesses here. We don't have time to prove that right now. But um, very strange events that took place at the death of Moses. We discussed those where Michael the archangel was contending with the devil about the body of Moses. He dared not bring a railing accusation against him, but said, The Lord rebuke you! Someday Michael's going to win. We looked at that last week. But Satan right now, he's the prince of darkness. He's the prince of the power of the air. He's, he's the one who's got most of the hearts and minds of people on planet Earth under his control. The day is coming. He's going to be judged. God's going to think, send back Moses. Very strange things about his death. God buried him. Elijah, who was caught up, in the whirlwind, didn't go up in the chariot. By the way, read your text carefully. Most of the pictures that you see painted of the Elijah event show him going up in the chariot. It says he was taken up in the whirlwind. The chariot separated between Elijah and Elisha, and he was taken up in the whirlwind. His body wasn't found. Very strange things going on here. We have two witnesses who are doing the same things that those two prophets did. Chapter 16, verse 3. And the second angel poured out his vial, that is the bowl, upon the sea, Here's your salt water. And it became as the blood of a dead man. What's the blood of a dead man like? It's coagulated. It stinks. And every living soul in the sea died. Same thing that happened with the rivers in Egypt. Verse 4. And the third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and fountains of water. That's the fresh water. So you got salt water in verse 3. you got fresh water in verse 4. And they became blood. 
to understand why God has put blood as the first of the plagues against Egypt. Verse 6, he tells you why. Same thing he did down in Egypt. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. Just like the days of Moses. God gives them blood to drink. Now I want to talk about something very important here because we've discussed this in the past. And how tired I am of amillennial theology, much of what which runs rampant in the Reformed camp and in even Bible Presbyterians, though Bible Presbyterians are predominantly premillennial, pre-tribulational. Do you understand what's going on here? If you allegorize the book of Revelation, which is what the amillennial and postmillennial camps do, if you allegorize the book of Revelation, you also have to allegorize the book of Exodus. Because we see exactly the same things taking place here. Given prophetically in Exodus by means of those judgments that God poured out on Egypt, stated as what's going to happen in the future. Oh, that's not really going to happen in the future. That blood in the sea is not going to turn to blood. Oh, the blood of the world, that's not really going to turn to, to blood. It just, it just means that it's really, really going to be a very bad, bad, bad time. Really, folks? Then what's to keep you from allegorizing what happened in Exodus? If you can mythologize away one part of the Bible, what's to keep you from mythologizing away another part of the Bible? If you can allegorize the book of Revelation, what's to keep you from allegorizing all that happened to the children of Israel in the wilderness? If you can say it didn't really happen, those are just nice stories designed to teach some ethical lessons. Folks, the Bible is true. The Bible tells us what happened, and the Bible tells us what is going to happen. And then it has called us to walk by faith in the midst of a world filled with darkness where God parts the sea before us and eventually brings us to the promised land. Yes, those things are lessons for us, but they happened upon those people for our edification upon whom the ends of the world are come. Read 1 Corinthians chapter 10 where Paul tells you those things happened, but they were designed to teach us some lessons about how God works. He's a true God. He's a living God. He's the source of life. Not some evolutionary primordial soup. Not merely a mixture of hydrogen and oxygen. As one blasphemous evolutionist has said, in the beginning, hydrogen. Nonsense. In the beginning, God. And blood by itself does not have life. He breathed into Adam's nostrils the breath of life, and Adam became a living soul. And the life of the flesh, that's the nephesh, the soul of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. It had to be perfect blood. It had to be pure blood. It had to be the blood of Christ, incorruptible, so that you and I might have life as we come under his blood. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word and for its power. There is nothing haphazard about it. There is no accident. The order in which these miracles, these plagues were given, you declared yourself to be the living God, the true and living God, the God over all the gods of Egypt, the God over the so-called God of life, the source of life for Egypt. You're the living God. You're the true source of life. You're the only one upon whom we can depend for having life. Jesus said, I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Jesus is our life. It is his blood that gives us life. The wages of sin is death, the stinking, rotting, putrid blood of the Nile. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. 
And Father, for this we thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen.